Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm excited today to uh, moderate this program. My uh, name is Dominic Quazera, and I am the uh, owner of Dom Law PA, a firm in Tampa, Florida, that handles personal injury, business litigation, and uh, intellectual property. And I'm, I'm excited today to be joined by Lazaro Caravajal, uh, the founder of Lazaro Caravajal Law Firm, uh, Ava Zelensky, founder of Zelensky & Associates PC, Daniel Alonzo, sales manager for Martindale & Nolo, and John Fergelli, SEO specialist from Martindale Hub. Now, I want to tell you a little bit more about the actual webinar itself. Uh, in terms of questions, you can submit your questions through the webinar platform. Uh, the question and answer session will take place during the last 15 minutes. Any unanswered questions will be responded to after the event. And a webinar replay will be provided to all attendees and registrants after the event. So with that, Daniel, if you could please get us started. Sure. Okay. So let's start with a few quotes from some wise attorneys that we've worked with. As Reza noted, the most important part of a case is getting one. As Ross advised, work on your business, not on it. What they're both essentially saying is that business development is critical to the success of your practice. Moving on. All right, so business majors learn that there's four primary ways to grow your business, the first one being market penetration and the second acquisition. Today, we're going to focus on the tactics to be successful at product expansion and market expansion. Moving on. Okay, so let's start with your primary practice areas. A best practice is to start with one, maybe two areas first. This gives you a chance to learn these areas really well and focus on growing your business there. Now, when you're thinking about this, first and foremost, think about your interest and skill set. If you're highly technical, you may want to consider intellectual property. Do you like a good fight? Maybe PI. Maybe you don't like a good fight. DUI. Next up, consider specialty areas also that are greatest in demand or what may be lacking. For example, elder care law, Medicare fraud continue to be a hot area given our aging population. Also, intellectual property lawyers who specialize by industries such as pharmaceuticals or are in areas with a lot of startups like the San Francisco Bay Area. I'd say at the next level down, think about where you live. If you're living in an area with a large senior population, you may want to consider estate planning. If you're in Miami, Florida, you might want to consider immigration law. Or if you're in Kansas, workers' compensation. Then, you might want to think about what may, what may be more transactional or big stake. And what I mean by that, DUI being more transactional provides a smaller revenue potential, whereas personal injury is a larger stake, longer to reap the benefits, but many times worth the wait. Moving on. Okay, so how do you start expanding into new practice areas? Well, your credibility will be higher and your time to market shorter if you consider practice areas that complement your existing practice areas. So what do I mean by this? Let's say that you're a DUI attorney. Complementary areas might be personal injury, bankruptcy, or even family law, since DUI clients will often also have problems related to these areas. Now, once you've decided on a new practice area, however, make sure you build your competency in that area before taking on cases. Take on simple cases and build from there. You don't want to put yourself in a situation where you cannot resolve the legal issue you've been hired to, to address. Now, we know it's easy to fall into the trap of hanging out with lawyers who practice the same type of law that you do. And as you decide to expand into different practice areas, knowing lawyers with already established practices in those areas can guide you on the pros and cons. Most bar association sections permit non-members to attend their regular meetings. CLEs, and other events. As we'll learn, networking will not only serve to educate you, but also gain you prospective new clients. 
And certainly, research your competition because you don't want to choose a new practice area in the market that you're already in that's saturated with lawyers in that same practice area. Moving on. Okay. Now, the easiest way to expand geographically is to create a business relationship with a lawyer elsewhere in your state or across state lines. Find other geographies that have a critical mass of your target client. For example, if you practice estate planning or elder care law, where will you find large communities of retirees? On the other hand, if you practice immigration law, consider large hubs for incoming foreign nationals, such as Miami, San Diego, or New York. Numerous lawyers divide their practices between two separate locations in order to grow their client base. Also, another avenue to consider is building your practice into an area governed by federal law, which means that you can practice in any state. Areas of the law that meet this criteria include immigration, SSDI, patent law, assuming you pass the patent bar test, and federal tax law. And keep in mind, with this expansion, it doesn't require you to move. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce you to Lazaro Carvajal from Carvajal Law, who's going to share with you his story of how he expanded his practice. Lazaro? Thank you, Daniel. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. My name is Lazaro Carvajal, and I'm a solo practitioner in northern New Jersey. And my background uh, is probably a little different than your typical attorney in the sense that uh, the law is actually a second career for me. Um, I didn't go to law school till I was 40 years old. And I think that my mindset going to law school was completely different than your typical law student in the sense that I knew I was never going to be at a big firm. I didn't think they would be interested in me, nor I was really interested in that type of career either. So I always focused on being a solo practitioner. And I always tried to prepare myself in the areas that a typical small client being an, either an individual or a small business would need. Um, so I wasn't looking to learn mergers and acquisitions. I was looking to learn um, divorce, real estate, uh, credit or debtor issues, and some minor criminal matters such as um, uh, restraining orders, domestic violence, and some DUI. Now, when I left law school, uh, fresh out of law school, I did find, I did take a job at a small firm, basically because I thought that law school may have prepared me theoretically to practice law, but never, they never really teach you the practical sense. You know, I have a cause of action. Okay, what do I do with it? So I took a job at a small firm. Um, the pay was crappy, but... My experience was great. Uh, the small firm, uh, they did a wide, very wide range of law, and they were pretty much overwhelmed with work. So that means from day one, I was making court appearances, and I was covering just about every area of law you could imagine, and I really gained a lot of experience. I did that for about two years, and about two years after the, uh, excuse me, after two years, I decided to go out on my own. And... Uh, that's a tough decision. Um, I found that once I was on my own, I, I, I couldn't be a jack of all trades. I definitely needed to focus uh, for two reasons. Number one, um, so I could specialize more in a particular areas of law where, number one, I would enjoy them, and uh, I thought I was good at them, but also I found that marketing myself, it's difficult to market yourself as a jack of all trades. If you focus on one, maybe two areas, uh, that's the most helpful. I focused uh, primarily on family law, uh, divorces, uh, things like that, TROs, and uh, I also focused on bankruptcy. Um, I just thought that the amount of time you put into a bankruptcy case compared to the the amount of money you can charge uh, was extremely uh, efficient. And the the federal system itself, the whole bankruptcy system, is just also so much better than the state system. Um, when, as far as costs, um, I, I looked into it, and you can get a virtual office uh, very inexpensively. 
but I didn't do that. I, I, I got a small office, which I shared with another attorney, and the, the rent was very low, and we split it. And we basically had this office on, as an as-needed basis where I would actually do some paperwork and filing, stuff like that at home, and I would just schedule meetings with clients. Because I found it's important for your clients to see that you have a, a legitimate location. It kind of adds credibility to you uh, as an attorney. Um, the most important cost, um, more than the startup cost, I would say is the overhead. Somebody told me a long time ago, it's not how much money you bring in, it's how much money you keep at the end. And, um, and that's what I focus. So I have very low overhead. My rent was very low and my expenses were very low. And my, my largest expense was my marketing costs. And I played with just about every kind of low-cost marketing you can think of, everything from direct mail to, you know, I didn't do any television or billboards because that's expensive, but I focused on direct mail at first with traffic matters, then I expanded into foreclosure matters and things like that. And eventually I found that uh, the best way to market yourself is on the Internet. Google is an amazing tool. Uh, Google My Business is amazing. If you want to spend a little more money, you can try um, Google AdWords. But um, anyway, that, that is basically my story. And at this point, I would uh, like to pass it on to Ms. Ava Zelenetsky so she can share her story. Thank you, Lazaro. And uh, good afternoon. My name, as you heard, is Ava Zelenetsky. I'm the founder of Zelenetsky and Associates PC. And the firm Zelenetsky and Associates PC does exclusively plaintiff's work. Before doing plaintiff's work, I was essentially an insurance defense lawyer. I had worked at a couple of small plaintiff's firms, but most of my career, about 12 years, um, was really doing insurance defense work. and um, working for defense firms. So I had learned the defense aspect of things. When I decided to go out on my own, I didn't have any insurance carriers to take with me. So I thought the logical step, rather than learn a new area of law, which you certainly can if you have the time and interest, but um, I did not. Uh, I, I liked working in personal injury. So I went out and became a plaintiff's personal injury lawyer. Of course, the, uh, the only drawback with that is plaintiff's work is one of the most competitive areas of law, if not the most, simply because there's potentially so much money involved and a lot of the larger firms uh, do advertise and, and saturate the market and are able to get most of the, or a lot of the plaintiff's cases. So it's extremely difficult for a solo practitioner to survive in this in this uh, area and when I went out on my own and I said I'm going to do plaintiff's work I was told by many people you can't do that only you're going to have to do other things like real estate wills landlord tenant essentially other things to survive in business and I discounted that and I dismissed it and I made up a plan and uh, five years later I'm glad to say I was right they were wrong and I'm still very happy doing plaintiff's work, and you can look at some of our results on our website, uh, www.lawforaccidents.com. Uh, we're a growing firm, and we handle plaintiff's work, and we still handle it. When I started the firm, a very important thing, as Lazar had mentioned, is you do need to be aware of, of how much money you're making, of cash flow, of your expenditures. So to begin, I didn't have that many cases. I might have had one or two, um, and that's not really unusual when you start out your firm. So most of my time was spent marketing my firm, networking with other lawyers, and making sure that I kept cash flow coming in. And one way of keeping the cash flow coming in, rather than waiting for my one or two cases to resolve, was doing per diem work for other lawyers. And I did that. I did court appearances, depositions, arbitrations. And the great thing about per diem work is you're in an arena where you get to network with other lawyers in that area that you're practicing. You get to have more results 
to to uh, boast about and as well as continue to get your name out there. And some of those lawyers who I had started off doing per diem work for, I and ended up becoming some of my referring attorneys, which which has been terrific for the practice. Now, basically, you really don't need that much to start up a law firm. Uh, you really need what I consider the essentials, a law degree, a computer, a printer, internet access, basic office supplies, and an office address, as well as a fax and business card, and, and your knowledge and wherewithal. And while some need the full-time office and, and spend a lot on an impressive office address, for solo or small firms, I like keeping overhead very low. I either favor a small firm situation where you're renting a very low-cost office or a virtual office and a good reliable one. I've been with the Westchester Business Center now for about four years. It's a virtual office and they've been phenomenal and very helpful to me and to my business. So, and my clients like it. Um, I meet clients there. I have a home office where I keep the cases, maintain the cases, and everything has been going well doing that. So I'm, I'm quite happy with the virtual office. Now, as your business grows, some people will immediately start with a website. I didn't favor a website, and I don't favor a website for immediately uh, hanging out a shingle. You want to get some results on your own. You can boast about results you've had at other firms, but it's still not you running the show and you getting the results. I waited several years before I decided to build a website and call it lawforaccidents.com. And I was able to have many results that, that were gotten in the name of Zalnatskin Associates or in my name alone while I was building that firm. And that way it's more representative of what you and your law firm do rather than the work you did. And it's certainly ethical to uh, promote and, and post work you've done in another law firm. But I find it, it's, it's just easier for clients to understand this work you did in your name alone, in your firm's name alone. And there's also, if I have a little bit more time, there's also the question of uh, staff. Some people have spent a lot of money on staff. I like to use per diem attorneys. Um, I started off as a per diem attorney. Certainly using per diem attorneys, you get experienced attorneys who really know the field and you don't have to pay them full-time salaries. The only drawback is you don't have them at your beck and call all the time, but it works out. It's, it's worked wonders for myself, for my small firm, and I know other solo practitioners who really um, benefit tremendously from using per diem attorneys. It's like you have a team uh, and a, almost a larger firm presence, but you still have that small firm uh, solo practitioner uh, mentality and and the uh, level of, of uh, experience and attention that you can devote to your clients. It just increases it and helps you tremendously to have the per diem attorneys available. And I'm grateful for mine. And now we're going to hear from Daniel again. All right. Thank you, Lazaro and Ava. Okay, so now that you've established your primary and complementary practice areas, let's talk about how to promote them. Moving on. Well, if you recall one attorney's quote, work on your business, not in it. This slide is all about what specific business development activities you should focus most of your time on. In fact, as many attorneys advise, 90% of your time should be dedicated on advertising or promotions, lead follow-up and nurturing, and networking. And I hate to tell you this, but only 10% is actually left for actually being a lawyer, doing the intake and the casework. So let's review these activities. Moving on. So how do you get in front of the consumer today? Well, technology has afforded us many avenues to connect today. 
And it's interesting to know that there are over 110 million searches for keywords related to attorney, lawyer, or law firms. So if you consider that 76% of consumers are online, you'll see that there's several ways for them to connect via SEO, SEM, or lead generation. And it's also important to note the number of attorneys in the United States and ask yourself, what are you going to do to stand out from the competition? Moving on. So we did a survey of 300 attorneys, and they told us that responding quickly and frequently was critical. In fact, 71% of them told us that they followed up within one hour. Because the longer you take, the more time you give other attorneys to reach that prospect and win your business. Also, it's important to note that 77% of attorneys said it took two or more times before they were able to contact a prospective client. And as you can see at the bottom, some took as long as 15 plus times. The point here is that you should try as much as possible. Every try increases the probability of your reaching the prospect. Moving on. Okay, so we mentioned earlier how networking is a great way to educate yourself. Well, it's also a great way to gain new clients. But networking can be a challenge for many. So here are a few tips. First and foremost, you want to understand your target audience. And in this case, don't think of your target audience in terms of potential clients. Think of other lawyers and professionals who work with your potential clients. For example, one of our DUI attorneys said he reached out to chiropractors because he knew many of their patients had personal injuries from car accidents. Ironically, one chiropractor said, you're the first attorney who's contacted me. Yes, I have a number of patients who ask me for an attorney recommendation, and I just don't know anyone. Now, keep in mind, if you're a bankruptcy attorney, you want to meet with CPAs, real estate agents, auto dealers. Why? Because they're constantly checking credit reports to qualify people for auto loans. And really anyone in the financial planning industry, including insurance agents. Credit repair companies are also great here as well. Now, following along with the chiropractor example, you might want to consider conferences where you can exhibit or reach chiropractors. At the conference, ask for a list of attendees and reach out to the chiropractors in your area. I know it sounds like common sense, but listen, you're talking with someone. This means no pitching no, and more taking notes of what that professional and his clients need. Also, follow-up with your contacts is key, and you want to do it within 24 hours. Use LinkedIn. You, know, you don't even need to know their email address. Just look up their name and company, send them an invite to connect. Mention a point perhaps that they made that, uh, that you noted during the conference. Moving on. Okay, so let's be honest. Most of the time, you're not going to be able to reach the person, even though you've asked, they've asked you for you to contact them. Yet, you need to stay in front of your leads or prospective clients and keep them engaged with you. This is what we call lead nurturing. Now, there's an easy way to do this through email. And as you can see to the right, this is a simple email used to follow up with a lead. Now, what may not be so obvious is that this email includes some quick tips as well as an intro to the attorney's DUI services. Each tip link backs to his site, bringing that lead in closer to learn even more about the attorney's services. Now, the attorney who wrote this email knew his audience and formulated the tips based upon their most urgent needs. Now, this is an important point because the email and content should always be focused on the needs of your audience, the consumer. Now, in fact, nowadays, there's some really great services as well for automating email for you, like Constant Contact and MailChimp are just two of them. Now, with any of these services, you can create a drip campaign or a series of emails that can get sent out each day to the prospect. The chart on the bottom left shows what a DUI attorney did. By the time he did reach the lead, the lead, she said, thank you for all the great information. And this made it much easier for him to retain this person as a client. And with that said, I'd like to pass it now along to you, John. Thank you very much, Daniel, and thank you, Lazaro and Ava, for all the good information. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm John Farigelli. I'm an SEO specialist at Martindale Hubble. And to start, I'd like to actually piggyback off of what Daniel was discussing, um, discussing about leads and all of that. How do you drive leads to your website? 
Well, what we're going to discuss, or what I'm going to discuss right now, is search engine optimization, abbreviated SEO. In its simplest terms, it's ranking relevant keywords in search engines such as Google and Bing, for example. And what do you intend to do with SEO? You want customers who have intent. So, for example, let's say you're a personal injury attorney in Chicago and somebody just got into a car accident, they're looking for an attorney. They're going to go right to Google and they're going to type in a keyword such as personal injury lawyer in Chicago or something similar. And what's going to come up? They're going to come up with a bunch of listings. You're going to see some paid listings, you're going to see some local map listings, and you're going to see some organic search listings, which I'm going to show you in the next few slides. And the ultimate goal here is to capture those customers who have intent who are searching directly for you. Now, what are the types of search engine optimization? It's you have local search engine optimization and organic. Local is building and claiming your local profiles, such as Yelp, Google My Business, Bing, Apple. And the goal here is you want to signal to Google that you're a real business. What does that mean? You want to have photos in your listings. You want to have the proper phone numbers, the proper name, uh, and also your information, your categories. What kind of attorney are you? Are you personal injury? Are you criminal? Are you bankruptcy? Are you divorce and family? And organic search engine optimization, the way to get there is you want to write relevant content with keywords that are targeted to the cases that you want. So, for example, if you're a criminal attorney, you want to write some relevant landing pages, some relevant blog posts, and some relevant content towards, let's say, DUI, uh, any kind of criminal justice cases that you want. And what you don't want to do is you don't want to spam. As you can see here, I say do not spam. Spam is basically when you stuff your content with keywords, such as, I am a criminal defense attorney in Chicago, and I am the best criminal defense attorney in Chicago. You don't want to say things like that. Uh, moving on. Uh, here's a local SEO example of one of the clients that I work on, and it's uh, the name of the firm is Willis McKenzie LLP. And as you can see, this is just a sample keyword, personal injury attorney in LaGrange. Uh, they're in Georgia and you can see how they are in the local map listings. This is what local SEO does. It'll get you in the local three pack, which I'm sure plenty of you have seen when Googling your own keywords. Um, and another thing I want to discuss is reviews. And the reason why I use this example is reviews will help you generate a lot more leads. Because I'm, as I'm sure everybody in this webinar has done at some point, You've done a Google search or some kind of search on the internet, and you've looked at the reviews of companies, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's say uh, anything. And the example that we use, when now while they are ranking very high, they actually don't have any reviews, and without the reviews, you actually get less leads. So, the moral of the story here is, you want to get more reviews for your business so you can generate more leads. Reviews are also a ranking signal. And that's what Google looks for. And obviously the ultimate goal here is you want to drive users to your website who have the intent to use your service. Moving on. Real quick, I wanted to show an, an organic SEO example. You've got 10 listings below the map listings. It's located uh, below the local results, which you've seen. And, and the way to get here, you want to have good content relevant with your keywords. You want to have good on-page optimization with your meta tags, title tags, and all of those. And you also want quality solid links pointing to your website. Moving on. Okay, so how do you want to use your website in your online presence? First off, do you even have a website? And if you don't, we highly recommend that you get one. A high quality website that makes you feel proud and looks professional. Now, once you have that website, what do you want to do? You want to assess your website's current position in Google and also your online presence. Where are you ranking? Are you even ranking? And if you're not, you need to formulate some kind of search engine optimization strategy in order to really get in the game. You also want to look at your competitors. What are they doing? What are they ranking for? Are they doing well? 
And is there anything that they're, that they're doing that you can reverse engineer? And of course, like I, like I have been saying, you want to add quality relevant content and optimize your website in order to get in the game. I'm moving on. Now here, if you have a new practice area and you want to market it, there's a few different ways to do it. In this slide, I want to show how if you're, if you're going into a new geographical area, so for example, what we're using here, Willis McKenzie, they are a, they're an attorney in LaGrange, Georgia. Let's say they wanted to move into a brand new geographical area. The best way to do this, you want to get a brand new physical office location. Uh, virtual offices, uh, Google doesn't like virtual offices anymore. You want to signal to them that you are a real business. So you want to have a unique office location. You want to have a unique phone number and a unique suite number if you, ha if you can get it. Uh, Google also doesn't like uh, P.O. boxes because they're very easy to get and it also signals to them as spam. As well, if you're moving into a new practice area, like this example here of Willis McKenzie, they moved into personal injury. They added a lot of relevant content to their website. They updated their categories to show that they are a personal injury attorney. And that's something else that Google looks for. They want to know that you are a personal injury attorney, and they want to know what locations you serve. Moving on. And last but not least, for all the attorneys out there, you want to spread the word. If you have it, again, if you want to market a new practice area, or any practice area really, the best way to get new, one of the best ways to get new business is make announcements to current clients. You can also use SEO, like I said before. Um, you want to make some announcements to some clients, write them a personalized email, uh, email blast like Daniel had discussed before. Um, you also have social media. There's Facebook, there's LinkedIn, which is very popular among attorneys. Uh, and Facebook and Twitter are very popular right now. Many, many people use them and they have massive, massive traffic right now. Uh, there's also the local news media, print, line, direct mail, things like that. And of course, last but not least, your blog. I highly, highly recommend if you have a website, you should have a blog. You can write content, it keeps your website fresh. Not only that, it gives helpful information to anybody who's on your website. So for example, if you have a user who hasn't decided whether or not they're gonna call you, if you have a good blog and they're reading your blog, it shows them that you're the authority in your own industry. It builds trust. And it also, not only that, it builds authority with Google because, once again, fresh, quality, highly updated content, that's what Google's looking for. Moving on. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you know, being a solo practitioner myself, uh, I've got to tell you that hearing uh, a lot of that advice was, was very much on point and extremely helpful. Um, we're going to get to our question and answers very soon, but before we... Before we do that, I just want to remind you that you've tuned in to two proven growth strategies for solo and small law firms sponsored by Martindale NOLO Legal Marketing Network and the American Bar Association Young Lawyers Division. Uh, Martindale Legal Marketing Network helps attorneys grow their practice with the largest legal marketing network. Uh, it features 15 million visitors plus 100,000 requests for attorneys per month. Uh, online legal directory profiles uh, is an important part of the Martindale Legal Marketing Network practice, and it includes 55 plus legal practice areas nationwide. Uh, the professional website uh, is a feature of the Martindale uh, Hubble Legal Marketing Network, and you can have a full website launched in less than one month. And then finally, the Engage Live Chat allows for two times the conversation of website visitors for any prospective clients. And with that, we're going to go ahead and jump into the question and answers portion of this webinar. Now, my first two questions are going to be directed to Daniel. So Daniel, if you don't mind, the first question is, what are best practices to market and advertise to new clients? 
Okay. Well, if you recall the advertising slide, we suggest you focus most, if not all, your advertising online because over 76% of consumers are going there to search for attorneys. Luckily, nowadays, uh, there are many ways to connect with prospects online. Among the top three are search engine optimization, or SEO, search engine marketing, SEM, like Google AdWords, and lead generation. Now, John covered SEO. John, was there anything else that you wanted to add further? Um, as far as SEO goes, no. I feel like we, we really hit it. Um, I mean, unless there's more questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, you know, we do have a number of great white papers, articles, and on-demand webinars as to how to generate leads to start with, and we can provide some of these resources in the last slide of this presentation. Great. Thanks so much, Dan. And, and if you don't mind, I actually have one more question for you. Uh, question is, what are some of the effective ways to advertise a solo practice at a low cost? Okay. So as I mentioned, you know, you should consider the top three online marketing tactics, SEO, SEM, and lead generation. SEO can take three to six months to take effect, and Google AdWords can be quite expensive. Meanwhile, lead generation services will help generate leads in volume and practice area now. You know, you want to look for programs that charge you on a pay-per-lead program and that don't try to tie you into a long-term contract. We would be glad to provide you with more information about this later. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, Dan. And now I've got a question for, for Ava. Uh, Ava, you were talking about um, switching from you know, different firms, so uh, this question is perfect for you because the question is, at what point in one's big law career has one accumulated enough resources and or experience to start your own solo or small firm practice? Well, I think that's a very individualized uh, question for, and it would depend on the attorney's level of comfortability, really. I don't think you hit a mark, say, you're out one year, five years, ten years. Some people can practice their whole lives and never be ready to go out. I think pro if you're thinking about it, probably, I guess on average, around ten years is a good time to start thinking about it, you have enough experience to really hit the ground running. Although there are many lawyers who have gone out right straight from school and, and who practice and who flourish. So again, I think it really depends on the individual lawyer, their interests, their capabilities, and of course their comfortability level with it. I personally did not go out on my own until I had been practicing with other firms and accumulated a lot of experience and and then I started my own firm I it was probably 12 years into it by then so I had a little over 10 years of uh, great experience with other firms okay that that's helpful and uh, so your the actual the name of your firm is Zelensky and Associates PC so that assumes that you have other attorneys working for you as you had mentioned in your in your own presentation. So would you mind commenting on hiring attorneys that can handle cases not in your specialty? For example, you know, you do uh, personal injury. So what is what would you do if you had to hire an attorney for, I don't know, a business litigation matter? If I was looking to bring an attorney aboard in my firm to handle that area or, or if, as a client looking to hire an attorney? No, no. As an attorney, a, a partner in your firm, if let's say you needed to bring on for one of your better clients or one of your best clients, you needed to bring on a, an attorney to handle a case for them. Uh, what? How would you approach that as as a managing partner of your firm? Right. Well, I would probably prefer. I mean, if I could, I would prefer to get an attorney who has a lot of experience in whatever practice area I'm mm -hmm. looking to fill the gap and, and bring the attorney aboard in. Uh, law is very specialized and it, it's somewhat dangerous to deviate outside of your practice area. However, you don't want to necessarily view other people and pigeonhole them as only being able to do one type of law. I, if I wanted to, I'm sure I could do other areas of law other than personal injury, but that's where my interests lie. So basically, 
to answer the question, you whichever attorney you'd bring aboard in that area of law, even if it's not something they've done for most of their career, as long as they have a sufficient level of experience and, and can handle that area of law, uh, and they can they could demonstrate it by showing you case results, by, by showing the knowledge in that particular area of law, then it's, it should be fine to bring them aboard. Okay, and if you don't mind, can I ask you what do you what do you think is a sufficient number? If you could, what do you think is a sufficient number of years of practice in a practice area before an attorney can say they, ha they have enough experience to practice competently in that area? Again, that would depend on the particular attorney, but I think on average, at least three years, I would like to see closer to five, but I tend to be okay. more conservative. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for, for that feedback, Ava. Now, John, we talked a lot about blogging during this webinar, and I wanted to ask you, do you think that regular blogging really helps the website get better exposure on the Internet? That's a great question, and I'm glad that it was asked because it's something that we really believe in over here is adding quality content helps. So the, the short answer to this is absolutely. Uh, it keeps your website fresh, and that's one of the biggest factors that Google looks for is to see that your website is constantly updating and constantly adding new quality content. So, for example, if you are a personal injury attorney, for example, you can add in any kinds of blog posts about some of the cases that you have or maybe you can add in a blog post about what are the ways to stay safe during a holiday season uh, because a lot of times a lot of car accidents or how do you stay safe at work if you slip and fall things like that you know anything that has to do with what your cases are that's what we want you to do and that's exactly what Google looks for okay Oh, I realize that this may cost money. So for smaller law firms, John, do you uh, think that it's worth investing money in marketing with companies such as best lawyers, super lawyers, vendors such as that? Right. Um, honestly, it's hard, it's hard to say with other companies, but there are benefits to large legal directories. So what I would recommend for these smaller firms who maybe not have a whole lot of money to invest, you can use these legal directories to build some backlinks to your website, which is something else that Google looks for. You want to be able to show that show Google that you're relevant in your industry, and also a lot of times these legal directories can give you relevant referral traffic to your site. So you want to get a link back to your site, and you also want to get traffic because the more traffic at the end of the day the more traffic you get to your site the more lead you're going to get especially if you're targeting the right people okay uh, Lazar I wanted to turn over a question to you how do you know when it's time to expand your practice for example you know from going jumping from a solo to a small practice or even a small practice to a mid-sized firm how do you know when it's time to expand? Well, um, like I said, right now I am solo. Uh, if I would even consider going to a small uh, firm, like uh, another group of attorneys, say, one or two others, I don't think I go past one other, maybe two at most. And quite frankly, I, I've never seen the benefit of creating partnerships unless you have a perfect symbiotic relationship where you can both feed off of each other. Uh, but short of that, uh, I'm a, maybe it's just the way I think. I'm just, I just prefer to be on my own. Um, so I, I, I really don't know. I never even thought about that, expanding in that way. I have thought about expanding uh, in other ways, uh, but I always find that the, the cost has to uh, just to, uh, justify the expansion rather you can't spend more money to expand rather you have to spend some money to expand but be very careful with that but like I said I, I'm 
I like being solo. I've never even considered a partnership, to be honest with you. Okay. Yeah, I mean, speaking from personal experience, I, I'm coming from a partnership. I had started a firm with uh, my former partner, and recently I went out on my own and started my own uh, law firm, and I can totally understand what you're saying, Lazaro. It is uh, a lot easier, and I feel a lot better for my clients to, to be a solo uh, and I, I myself am looking into expanding, but it's more on, a, on an associate level or even possibly a lateral hire as opposed to bringing on an additional partner. Um, so with that, I wanted to ask you, have you ever considered a lateral hire, hiring of attorneys? Um, no, I, I actually haven't. The only thing I, I did for a while, I had another – a more experienced attorney who practiced uh, personal injury. And what I did with him, I created an of counsel relationship. Okay. So we would work on cases together. You know, I would bring in the case and he would lend, uh, work on them. And he would obviously with his experience get, you know, it would be beneficial to me. And we would do some type of, uh, of arrangement on that. But as far as actually uh, hiring another attorney, um, Maybe it's because I my background is I was in business before I came to law, and I had several other employees. I mean, at one point I had, I don't know, somewhere between 15, 20, 15 to 20 employees. And I always, when I left that business, I always told myself I would never, I would never have to meet a payroll if I could avoid it. And uh, yes. that's just my approach to business. Okay. Yeah, that's understandable. Talking about payroll and capital, things like that, what, what would you say is the amount of initial capital that you should have or that, that you need to get your law practice off the ground? I would say the actual, the, the, the startup costs, uh, if, if you go conservatively and, like I said, if you share some office space or, or as Ava said, even a uh, virtual office, um, I mean, I just had to rent a small space. I shared the rent with another attorney. I bought, you know, minimal furniture, desk, chairs, and something for the walls. Uh, so the actual startup cost for the office itself was very small. What what I really put my money into was marketing, um, yeah. and I used at first I used direct mail. I I dabbled in Google AdWords a couple of times, and uh, John was right that can get pretty pricey pretty quick uh -huh. um, but overall I would say you know you want to cover your overhead for a couple of months at least two or three months before you start generating some income so if, if you take that approach just whatever your overhead is multiply it by two or three whatever times uh, however long you feel comfortable getting yourself on your feet I don't think I my initial startup cost I don't think was more than Two or three thousand dollars total, and like I said, some of that went into advertising. Yeah, I know. I'm I'm reading a book now that's actually published by the American Bar Association, and one of the it's about starting starting your practice and kind of the business. It's written from a business perspective about how to run a law firm, and I know in in, in that they had suggested that it's a good idea to have at least a year of your personal living expenses saved because more than likely you're not going to be taking a paycheck in your first year of practice. Now, would you agree with that, Lazaro? Absolutely. I, I didn't. Uh, I took it from the expense of running the office, but you're right. Wow. I, in that sense, I was lucky. I have a wife who also has her own career, so that uh, gave me yeah. a lot of buffer. But, yeah, if I was just me on my own, you're right. For the, uh, You have to look at the personal aspect of your life. Can you keep yourself afloat? and how long before the, the office starts generating income. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Lazaro. I wanted to turn it back now to, to Ava. Um, Ava, you had mentioned uh, about, um, you know, possibly not, or, or you didn't necessarily recommend starting a law firm right from law school. Um, so what, what do you, what tips would you have for solos with less than three years worth of professional experience if they did want to start their own law firm? I mean, we see that a lot now, you know, given the, the I don't know how it is in the, in the state that you practice, but I know in Florida there is a, a too many lawyers. So what's happening is a lot of law school graduates are 
out of sheer desperation, just hanging their shingle within their first year of practice. So, um, do you have any any advice on that? Right. I've I've certainly have seen more of that, and and I think it's uh, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, uh, they're getting a push early on uh, sure. out of that legal nest, so to speak. Um, uh, a lot of newer attorneys, out of sheer desperation, are hanging out their shingle. And if they have that entrepreneurial personality and they have the desire, I wouldn't recommend against it at all. I think that's okay. terrific. Uh, from personal experience, I didn't feel comfortable back when I started nearly 20 years ago of hanging my shingle right out of law school. I wanted to learn under other attorneys. I saw a lot of it, I believe, really depends on your, the personality of the attorney, the background of the attorney, uh, whether they have a business background or not. I didn't have a business background, and I learned business when I hung my shingle out, and I, I learned it by necessity. So all these factors really should go into play in terms of whether or not the attorney decides to make a go of it and hang out their shingle. And for newer attorneys who have that drive and that desire, and who, who are willing to, to take the you know proverbial legal bull by the horns, they mm -hmm. definitely should do it. They shouldn't they shouldn't hold themselves back. They might they might be hugely successful at it. And if they're not, they shouldn't just let that uh, defeat them in terms of whether they want to go out on their own in the future. Because they should realize it's very difficult for anyone to go out on their own and make a successful business. So if they start early out and then they decide to take a job somewhere and then five years later they want to hang their shingle out again, they shouldn't be discouraged by an early, uh, I wouldn't say failure, less than success. Okay. Well, thanks. That's incredibly helpful. Uh, I wanted to turn the tables now to, to John. Uh, John, what do you recommend as far as getting, getting your name out there? I know that you've talked about SEO and things like that. So. Uh, what advice do you have for young lawyers and, and recent solos in terms of getting their name out there? Yeah, that's another great question. Uh, there's really multiple avenues that attorneys and small law firms can use. Obviously, search engine optimization, which I discussed, mm -hmm. uh, make sure that you know your listings are are ranking high, making sure that your website is fully optimized with your title tags and your meta tags. That's the most important, as well as making sure that you have your content. There's also uh, there's also paid search, which I also briefly mentioned. If it fits into your budget, uh, as Lazaro mentioned, as as uh, I did mention, paid search can get a little expensive. But if it does fit your budget, I highly recommend it because it's another way to drive more traffic and more leads to your site. And we have some uh, some other ways, such as social media. Uh, we didn't really touch much on social media. However, I also recommend it. Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, it's very popular among attorneys because it's a, a professional network. Facebook is also popular because it gets to tons and tons of traffic on a daily basis. And not only that, it's a great way to build up trust, build up authority, and build up a really high-ranking reputation in your industry, especially in an industry where trust is everything. Definitely. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, 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 one more thing, Dom. Uh, you definitely want to get reviews. definitely want to get reviews and testimonials. Uh, for your, you have anybody who has had a positive experience with your firm, definitely get reviews on your local profiles, especially your Google My Business profile and your uh, your Google local profiles. You want to get those reviews, uh, four star, five star reviews. You want to make sure you get those because, uh, like I mentioned earlier, that's a a ranking signal. It's what Google looks for, and First and foremost, it allows people to see, okay, this is a high-quality attorney. This is an attorney that I want to deal with, especially because a lot of times attorneys, like, you're dealing with people's lives. I mean, it could be the difference between somebody going to jail, somebody getting a huge settlement that they deserve for a personal injury, for example. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times uh, people will rely on reviews to see what attorney they're going to choose. It's on that on that point, when do you suggest asking for a review, and, and how do you go about doing that? I mean, there's any number of ways. Um, obviously, the the when is the easy part. You want to mm -hmm. uh, make sure that you're talking to somebody who had a positive experience. Uh, you definitely don't want to 
uh, discuss with people that who didn't have a positive experience or felt like they did not they had a negative experience and the best way I uh, would simply to be just ask them personally say hey listen would you mind if you left us a positive review it would really help us and okay. if people are willing to do it they'll do it and a lot of times if, if people have had a, uh, a positive experience sometimes they will go out and leave a review not always but uh, yeah like I said you definitely want to make sure that you ask them personally and don't push don't solicit through email to make it impersonal don't offer incentives just say hey would you mind would you mind giving us a review it would really help our business I like that that's helpful so just pick up the phone and ask or, or even you know take them for coffee and, and ask him in person I, I agree that does make it a lot more genuine and it's a great way to make follow-up conversation it's a great way yeah. to continue to nurture the relationships with your clients like Daniel mentioned earlier mm -hmm. uh, because it's a lot of times it's a lot easier to get a repeat customer than it is to get a new customer so oh, yeah, I also. can tell you that's been, been very uh, very much the case with my practice is most of my new cases since I've started my, my own practice have come from prior clients that I, that I by the by the grace of God did a good job for and now they've referred me to their friends or business owners that are entrusting me with, with more of their work. So I can tell you that that is absolutely true. Um, so with that, I wanted to, we started with Dan, and I want to go ahead and give Dan one more, uh, one more question. Dan, I wanted to ask you, how do you stand out from the competition? Well, you know, it's all about the people you have on board. You want to have people that believe in what you're offering. Uh, you want to train them well, um, and at the end of the day, just remind them that uh, as they interact uh, with our client base, in this case, the uh, attorneys, that I remind my staff every day, there are people like you and me, you know, we all breathe the same air, we all walk on the same ground, so, you know, you know your product, be confident, um, you know, don't overstate anything, just be, you know, be a straight shooter, transparent, um, don't overpromise, um, but set the right expectations in your communications, and um, that goes a long way. Great. Well, that's all the time we have for questions, but before we close out, I wanted to take this opportunity to tell you about some additional resources that are that are available. Uh, on the last slide for this series, uh, you'll see a, a number of links that provide additional resources to you as participants in this podcast. And I also want to take some time to thank our sponsors and our speakers. Uh, first of all, our sponsors, Martindale, Noble Legal Marketing Network. Uh, thank you so much for supporting the American Bar Association and especially young lawyers. As a young lawyer myself, I can tell you that it means a lot to me that we have such great support from, from you guys. So thank you. And I also want to take a moment to thank each of our speakers. Uh, Lazaro, founder of the Lazaro Karapahal Law Firm. Thank you, Lazaro. Uh, Ava Zelensky, founder of Zelensky and Associates, Daniel Alonzo, sales manager at Martindale Legal Marketing Network, and then John Ferrugli, SEO specialist at Martindale Legal Marketing Network. Again, thank you so much. And for those that joined us today, thank you and wishing you a great day.